I'm delighted to host a brilliant and eminent group of scholars to celebrate this most auspicious occasion, the bicentennial of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. If the past 200 years have taught us anything, it's that Frankenstein is an immortal book. Uh, more than any other novel, Shelley's book deals with the pleasures and perils of defying death. And tonight, the Faculty of English and Comparative Literature will offer their perspectives on precisely why this novel is so vital. Thank you all for being here. Um, but before we turn to the panel, I'd like to begin by introducing the book. Now, I'm not going to tell you that Frankenstein is the greatest novel ever written. No, I will leave that to them. Um, nor will I say that Frankenstein set the scene for modern horror, nor will I talk about how the book is a cautionary tale of scientific hubris. And I won't even mention that this exceptional work of fiction was written by an 18-year-old girl in a ghost story competition with the greatest poets of the age. No, no. Instead, I want to tell you why you should read the first edition of Frankenstein, the one we're celebrating tonight. Now, there are two very different published versions of the book, the 1818 first edition and the 1831 revision, which Mary Shelley heavily edited. And I want to encourage you to read the first edition for three reasons. So, first reason. The 1818 edition begins with an epigraph from Paradise Lost by John Milton. And Mary Shelley deleted this epigraph in the second edition. The quotation is taken from Adam's protest against God after the fall. He said, Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mold me now? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? Now, Adam's words could just as easily have been spoken by Frankenstein's monster. But in Milton's poem, within ten lines, Adam argues himself into the belief that God is right. He accepts his punishment. But Shelley, by taking his books out of con by taking the lines out of context, she begins her book with defiance. Just as Frankenstein's monster rails against his maker, by taking these lines from Milton, Mary Shelley is challenging her own literary progenitors, including her famous parents, Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin, to whom the book is dedicated. The epigraph from Paradise Lost then shows Shelley, like the monster, declaring herself independent from her maker right next to the dedication to her father. So that's pretty cool. Okay, number two. The second reason why you should read the 1818 text is that the first edition of Frankenstein was written in closest collaboration with Percy Shelley, the great romantic poet. And in fact, Mary and Percy got married during the writing of the book. We know that Percy Shelley edited the novel because the manuscript shows evidence of two different hands. And scholars estimate that Percy Shelley contributed about four or 5,000 words. So a pretty substantial contribution. And Percy's silent hand also shaped the novel's place in the literary canon. He wrote the novel's preface, which asserted the intellectual seriousness of Frankenstein by arguing for the scientific plausibility of the monster. And he even wrote an anonymous review of Frankenstein in a literary journal, where he praises his wife's book as an exhibition of intellectual and imaginative power which had seldom been surpassed. Percy Shelley's profound contribution to Frankenstein is at its most vivid in the first edition, since he was to die almost a decade before the second edition was released. Finally, reason number three. You should read the 1818 Frankenstein because its scientific vision is much more radical. The first edition includes Victor Frankenstein's childhood experiments with electricity, which Shelley removed from the later book. The revised Frankenstein contains no electricity at all. Perhaps more than any other scientific aspect of the book, the electrical charges from the first edition have shaped Frankenstein's afterlives in the popular imagination. And in keeping with its scientific radicalism, the whole philosophical outlook is much more daring in the first edition. In the 1818 edition, Victor possesses free will, the capacity for moral choice. He could have cared for his creature. But in 1831, such choice is denied to him, and he's the pawn of forces beyond his knowledge or control. So these are three reasons to read the 1818 version of Frankenstein, the 200-year-old text. Although tonight's panelists will, I'm sure, offer many more reasons. Now I'd like to ask Alan Stewart, the chair of the Department of English and Comparative Literature, to introduce our distinguished panelists. Thank you, Arden. Thank you all for being here. It's uh, great to see a packed room. Um, I do want to thank um, the sponsors of this event, um, the Explorations in the Medical Humanities Series at the Society of Fellows and Hanger Centre for the Humanities and the 19th Century Colloquium. Um, I am going to limit myself today to introducing these, uh, my colleagues. Um, <laughs> I was told this is a lightning round table, so I'm going to make this a series of lightning introductions. You'll just have to assume the general eminence of the people <laughs> to my right. Um, it is there. Um, so in the order in which they'll speak, uh, Eric Gray, to my right, is a professor of English and comparative literature, a specialist in Victorian poetry, and indeed in poetry more generally. 
His most recent book, which was celebrated here um, in the spring semester, is The Art of Love Poetry, which came out from Oxford University Press earlier this year. Dustin Stewart is an assistant professor of English and comparative literature. He specializes in 18th century British literature, with particular interest in poetry between Milton and Romanticism, which is pretty much Frankenstein, <laughs> and in religious identity after the Restoration. And he's currently completing a study of futurity and the soul in the period. Our third speaker is Joseph Albanaz, who has recently joined us this semester as an assistant professor of English and Comparative Literature, having completed his PhD at the University of California at Berkeley earlier this year. He specializes in the literature, especially the poetry of the Romantic period, and his main current project traces new formations of community, ecology, and the everyday of Romantic literature, and his 20th century and contemporary afterlives. Fourth, uh, we have Gary Vidwanathan, who is the class of 1933 professor in the humanities. She's published, of course, widely on education, religion, and culture, 19th century British and colonial cultural studies, and the history of modern disciplines. And she's also the current holder of the Mark Van Doren Award for undergraduate teaching here at Columbia. Her current project is a full-length study of the Russian occultist Helena P. Blavatsky. Julie Crawford <coughs> is Mark Van Doren Professor of Humanities and an early modernist in the department. Her most recent book was Mediatrix, Women, Politics, and Literary Production in Early Modern England, which came out from Oxford in 2014. She's currently completing a book entitled Margaret Cavendish's Political Career. And lastly, but not leastly, uh, <laughs> James Eli Adams, Professor of English Comparative Literature, and one of our eminent Victorians, Victorianist, sorry. <laughs> dated, dated, dated. <laughs> misdating. Um, he's the author most recently of a, a History of Victorian Literature in 2009. He's currently at work on a project entitled The Uses of Inheritance, Identity and Agency in Britain, 1789 to 1895. So please welcome our speakers. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try to stay within my uh, allotted time, which is ironic because I want to talk about anachronism. <laughs> so anachronism appears right at the very beginning of uh, Frankenstein uh, in one of the first letters that Walton writes right at the very beginning of the novel. He quotes Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And if, you, if you're paying very close attention, uh, you realize that this is almost impossible. Uh, chronologically, given the date of the poem. <clears throat> Still, it's the sort of thing that you might not notice, or you might notice and not think was, you know, uh, of any relevance, but then it happens again. Uh, Victor Frankenstein quotes the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which is far more impossible uh, than Walton having done it. And then it happens again. Uh, both Victor Frankenstein and his creature quote uh, a poem by Percy Shelley that wasn't published until 1816, uh, so 20 years after the events of the novel. Uh, so, you know, once you've noticed that it, you know, it keeps coming back, uh, you know, insistently, uh, it seems to call out for some attention. And when you do start paying attention, you start taking these anachronisms seriously, you realize that they are not an anomaly. Uh, the entire book, all of Frankenstein, centers around, or, or is based around, a series of anachronisms. Uh, or temporal disjunctions. Uh, so, uh, for instance, Victor blames the whole fiasco on the fa fact that his textbooks are outdated. Right? <laughs> uh, Victor, Victor reads these uh, books of occult science from the 16th century, treats them as if they were cutting-edge science, as if this were acknowledged you know, scientific fact, uh, and you know, later, as I say, he blames uh, the whole disaster on, on the sort of crazy ideas uh, that these old books put into his head. Meanwhile, uh, the generations of the uh, Frankenstein family are all mixed up. Uh, they're very confusing. So Victor's father marries somebody who ought to be his daughter. She's the daughter of his friend. But then, of course, she becomes his wife. And they adopt uh, Elizabeth, who uh, you know, is in the role of daughter, except the mother dies, she becomes the mother. So there's all this moving back and forth between generations. And, and the most prominent example is the creature himself, uh, right? who, when newborn, is already full grown. So he's Victor's son, right? he's Victor's offspring, in a way. 
but he's also Victor's contemporary. And then, because he's so large, uh, he is also, in certain scenes, Victor's father, uh, right? And, and he lectures uh, Victor on what to do. Meanwhile, at the level of narrative structure itself, you know, all narratives have uh, what's called fabula and sujet. That is, these two different time frames, the chronology of events as they would actually logically happen, and then the chronology that we actually encounter. In other words, the order in which we encounter those events. There's a difference between those in almost any narrative that you encounter. But it's foregrounded uh, in Frankenstein. In Frankenstein, it just seems to be the way that we always get consequences first. So first we see the effect, we see the death of young William, and then we go back later and we find out the causes. So effect comes first before cause does. Which is interesting because at yet a broader level, if you look at uh, the reception history of the uh, novel that Arden was uh, alluding to, that's the way we encounter the novel. You don't read the novel first. You come across Frankenstein as a scary monster, right? When, when you're doing Halloween, when you're six years old, you come across Boris Karloff's interpretation. You come across all the movie versions of it. So that the book, when you get to it, if you get to it, doesn't seem like the origin. It comes to seem like an, an imitation, and sometimes even a pale imitation of its offspring, as it were. So all of these instances of anachronism or, or temporal reversals, you know, at every level of uh, the novel. And I think that's interesting because we think of this as being a story about sequence and consequence and causality. And certainly in the film versions, that's what it is, right? This is a moral tale about the consequences of your actions. If you overreach as a scientist, if you do certain things, you are responsible for the consequences that ensue. And certainly it is a book uh, about that. I, th I think that's also there in the novel. But the novel is interesting because with all of these anachronisms, it also points to the opposite lesson, which is that chronology and consequence and sequence and causality are not actually true to our lived experience of the world. There are many occasions, not just with Victor's out-of-date textbooks, where the past is just as present as the present, that, that it has just as much effect and just as much force as the present does. And then there are even more occasions where, just as our experience is when we read uh, the novel, we experience effects first. And we go back and we assign causes later. In other words, Causality is, is a fiction. Uh, it's, it's part of the, the narrative logic that we use as a fiction uh, to help explain our lives. But it's a very powerful fiction, right? That narrative is a very powerful fiction, and therefore it takes a powerful fiction, like Mary Shelley's novels, to help us see through it, to help us question consequence and chronology and causality. Around four years ago, I was teaching Frankenstein near the southern base of the Rocky Mountains. The class charted a deep history of science fiction, and Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, or MWS, uh, stood at the center of our syllabus. Dusk was approaching, and as the light beamed into the classroom windows from the other side of Pikes Peak, my students were asking questions about authority. If the novel's main model for authority is the relationship between Victor and the creature, the trouble is that these two characters can't seem to address one another directly. They keep looking for some third mediating figure who can triangulate their relationship, even when it's still really all about the two of them. This is why the novel belongs in that great literary phenomenon that is called, as everybody knows, bromanticism. <laughs> <laughs> Yet the structural framing of Frankenstein also tries to force us readers to see the perspective of any given character through the vantage of another. We only get psychological light as it's refracted through at least one window, and usually more than one. This is one of MWS's great debts to the 18th century novel, to the likes of Richardson and Defoe. One student in my class was a retiree and a former engineer. He had a hard time accepting that the creature's options are so limited that he has no other prospects for contentment other than being coupled up with Victor or with some additional being who might be engineered by Victor. 
This student, whose life experience and conversational manner make him stand out in the class, floated a hypothetical suggestion for the sake of argument. Couldn't a creature have possibly joined up with one of the freak shows that were becoming popular entertainments in the 19th century? He was off historically by a couple of decades, but as you might guess, that wasn't the first objection raised by some of his classmates. Several of them explained that they self-identified as disabled and wondered if they, too, should have to accept that life as a freak, as part of a touring spectacle for lowbrow commercial entertainment, was sufficient. Besides, they went on, even if the creature were to submit to such an existence, would that really absolve Victor of the crime of having botched his authority over the life he created, for having refused to care for that life? It was very clear that for this group of students, all the moral power of the book comes from sharing in the creature's point of view. Fair enough. They had going for them a certain way of reading the Bible and, as Arden points out, a certain way of reading Paradise Lost. I thought they refused their classmates' compromise brilliantly well. But a couple of these students came to my office later that week to express displeasure. Why hadn't I used my professional authority, they wondered, to, to explain to the retiree why his suggestion was inappropriate and offensive? Why had I allowed his position to exist on seemingly equal moral and rhetorical footing with theirs? I did my best to answer the question, though that probably wasn't enough. I didn't apologize for my approach. I did, however, offer to follow up with their classmate, the retiree. When we talked in person again, I asked him to say a bit more about why he had made the point about freak shows. In his answer, um, he reflected on a family member of his who, because of a, develop a developmental disability, lived in a home for special needs people. He didn't see her as often as he would like, but he believed she was being cared for and he insisted that her life still mattered, still counted. It was clear enough that this student had strong personal reasons for imagining a different future for the creature, uh, a future that's not explored by NWS in the novel itself. But thinking about the book in this way insensibly led this student to adopt Victor's point of view. I draw no conclusions from this story except to say that the tension between these students who seemed unable to speak to each other productively without seeking my intervention or my triangulation, even though it really was all about them, <laughs> reprised a dynamic that exists in the novel itself. And I don't think this is an isolated case. You may know this already, but it turns out there's a listserv for professional scholars of the period and interested readers of Romanticism where the same kind of pattern unfolds. One infamous contributor says again and again, that MWS didn't really write Frankenstein in the way that matters. Percy Shelley did. And some other listserv participants, understandably frustrated, appealed to the listserv moderator to silence the conspiracy theorists <laughs> whose views, they say, don't belong on equal moral and rhetorical footing. <laughs> but the conspiracy theorist keeps writing to plead that other authorities elsewhere, not on the listserv, have in fact accepted his position and agree with his argument. The challenge of authority in Frankenstein, I'm saying, very easily slips into the challenge of orienting ourselves to Frankenstein, to MWS, and to her landmark novel. It's a book that still prompts readers, 200 years <coughs> on, to seek out some other figure to explain, or else explain away, the powerful hold it has on us. For my remarks, I want to take a quick second to sh show off one of my prized possessions, which is a facsimile copy of uh, Mary Shelley's Notebooks for Frankenstein that was made this year on the, in the Bicentennial. I'm happy to give you a look after the panel if you're curious. Um, so, Frankenstein is a book of and about beginnings. The beginnings of new life, of a new species, the beginnings of Mary Shelley's career as an author, of modern science fiction in many ways. And of course, there's the famous beginning of Frankenstein in the ghost story contest of 1816 in the Villa Diodati. It's, it's infamous beginning. But another beginning I'd like to draw attention to today is not in 1816, but 1815, April 10th, 
1815, on the island of Sumbawa, in what is present-day Indonesia. On this day, and in this place, the volcano Mount Tambora erupted, spewing, spewing a cloud of ash so massive that it um, traveled around the globe over the next several years, profoundly altering the climate, making 1816 into what we now know as the year without a summer. The summer of Frankenstein's composition is, is the year without a summer. And so this strange entanglement of climate and narrative is omnipresent in the novel, manifest already in Percy Shelley's preface, which suggests at the end um, that the other participants in the ghost story contest left off their compositions when the weather got better. They wanted it outside. <laughs> um, and of course, there's the frame narrative, which takes place in the, in the Arctic cold. And there's the book's constant tarrying with weather and seasons. The creature especially is fascinated by the changing of the seasons. Um, and we might also remember um, that in the very first exchange or conversation between Victor and the creature, outside at night, the creature's about to tell Victor his life story so far, but then stops himself and says, I'm paraphrasing, no, it's actually too cold. The climate's not right. We have to go inside because it's a long story. Okay. So th these are just kind of two quick instances of, the, of how climate and weather is integral in the very structure of narrative and otherwise of, of Frankenstein. Shelley would confront um, similar issues, environmental issues, and thinking about seasons and climate, more directly in her amazing and still underread 1824 novel, The Last Man, which deals with um, an apocalyptic plague that kills off all of humanity, but also um, seasonal disruption and environmental catastrophe and other calamities. But I think already in Frankenstein, these concerns are deeply resonant. A few weeks ago, the UN released a, a report detailing climate crises resulting from global warming coming sooner and being worse than almost anyone had thought up to the present, even scientists. This is one of the darkest prognostications yet for the current epic that both scientists and humanity scholars are now calling the Anthropocene, which is um, the geological epic named for the cumulative and unintended effects of human beings on the climate and the Earth system. So Frankenstein speaks to us in 2018, not only out of the context of its own intimation of the climate change of its own era, the year without a summer, and not only of, out of its now familiar warnings against the unintended consequences of human agency and technological <coughs> advancement, but also in reminding us to be careful of who we mean and don't mean when we say us. There can be no community between you and me, Victor tells his cre creature at one point. In this way, Frankenstein is truly an early novel of the Anthropocene, perhaps the first novel of the Anthropocene, precisely because it puts the human so explicitly in question, the Anthropos. And in another of Frankenstein's grim mirrorings of our climate future, those least responsible for unleashing the violence in the novel suffer the most. Of course, Victor and the creature suffer and die too. Although it's not his creature, nor his technology that kills Victor, but the climate. Victor dies, indeed it's not noted often enough, I think, that both the creature and Victor die from weather, or at least extremes in temperature. So Victor dies out on, uh, dies on this Walton ship from sickness that he's caught out in the freezing cold. While in, in the final pages of the novel, out in the Arctic ice, the creature tells Walton that he's going to go to the northernmost freezing point and burn himself into ash. He talks about this ash from his own body floating out into the air and into the sea. So in this way, strangely enough, the creature becomes the very substance that was causing the climate change in Mary Shelley's own day in 1816, ash from, from the volcano. But for us in 2018, this vision of the creature's death, that is, a fire burning out on an Arctic glacier, conjures all too chillingly um, and adumbrates a, a scene of our own environmental peril. talk about the place of alchemy and education in uh, Frankenstein, specifically related to Victor's discovery of Cornelius Agrippa, 
Albertus Magnus and uh, Paracelsus. Um, the, the novel constantly marks Victor's initial skepticism towards what other characters disparage as exploded superstitions and outmoded knowledge. Um, Victor often describes his attraction to the alchemists as arising out of what he calls a confused mind. And that phrase actually appears uh, quite a number of times in the novel. And it's driven by an undisciplined mingling of a thousand contradictory uh, theories. And this is how uh, Victor Frankenstein himself uh, frames this. The sense of an undisciplined mind is reinforced by repeated references to Victor's self-taught nature, which led him to want to explore the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life, all driven, as he insisted, by the desire to banish disease. His induction into formalized education doesn't do anything, however, to inculcate reverence for modern knowledge on his part. And modern knowledge remains too straight-jacketed to appeal to his quest for what he insistently calls real knowledge. Nor can he remain interested in medieval alchemy any longer. There is in Victor a lurking discontent with the European professor as a figure trapped by the disciplinary boundaries that determined authentic discoveries. And Victor himself shows a willingness to enter into the heretical space from which new ideas could emerge. When he first reveals his interest in Cornelius Agrippa to his father, <coughs> his father replies disdainfully, um, um, uh, my dear Victor, do not waste your time upon this. It is sad trash. Now Victor's <laughs> reaction is worth examining. And um, I, I do want to read um, this line because I think it's, it, 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 uh, it illustrates Victor's um, um, own difficulties in um, contesting the people who disparage his interest in alchemy, while at the same time um, he's not really able to um, uh, relinquish uh, uh, that interest. He's, and this is uh, from the law. He says, if instead of this remark, my father had taken the pains to explain to me that the principles of Agrippa had been entirely exploded, and that a modern system had been introduced which possessed much greater powers than the ancient, because the powers of the latter were chimerical, while those of the former were real and practical, I should certainly have thrown Agrippa aside. And he sees that as a major turning point in uh, what he uh, repeatedly describes as his fate, as his destiny. Victor's conviction that modern science was continuous from medieval alchemy may be attributed to his confused mind, but as the novel proceeds, that continuity gets expressed as a critique of disciplinary science for failing to provide the means for a comprehensive knowledge of nature's secrets. Victor's father's peremptory dismissal only heightened Victor's interest in Agrippa along with works by Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus. The melding of alchemy and education as twin themes comes to a fore when Victor goes to study at Ingolstadt University. He comes across two professors, Kremp and, and Waldman, both men of science, who held very different views of alchemy. Uh, Kremp, on one hand, ridicules Victor and tells him that his time has been wasted um, uh, studying alchemy. When Victor tells Kremp that he had been studying the alchemist, uh, Kremp responds, have you really spent your time studying such nonsense? A clear echo of his father's disparagement. Kremp goes on to say, you have burdened your memory with exploded systems. And again, that's a phrase that keeps repeating itself. Exploded systems and useless names. I little expected in this enlightened and scientific age to find a disciple of Albertus Magnus and Paracelsus. My dear sir, you must begin your studies entirely new. On the other hand, Waldman acknowledges Victor's readings in alchemy. And he even says that these men, referring to Agrippa et al., that these were men to whose indefatigable zeal modern philosophers were indebted for most of the foundations of their knowledge. He goes on to say in a very interesting observation that they, that is Agrippa and, and so forth, the alchemists, had left to us as an easier task to give new names, arrange in connected classifications, the facts which they 
in a great degree, had been the instruments of bringing to light. Now, I would suggest that there's no less than a radical suggestion that chemistry emerged as a discipline by giving a new name to what was previously associated with alchemy. Now, Waldner does not say what generally followed such formulations, which is that new names are given to alchemy, and then the concepts that were borrowed or adapted are discredited as black magic or illegitimate knowledge. Now, um, Alison Butler, you know, who's written this book on Victorian occultism and the making of um, modern magic, has this very brief allusion to, to Frankenstein, but it was, I thought, an interesting and important one. And she suggests that Agrippa got a bad rap in Frankenstein. In fact, she locates the, the kind of downward slide of Agrippa's career to Mary Shelley's um, um, use of Agrippa in Frankenstein. Um, and, that Frank, and that Agrippa ten, uh, was henceforth identified as an evil um, sorcerer. And, um, and, and from that point, um, Butler says, suggests that um, there's this defamation of uh, Agrippa's character, which has now been taken up by uh, modern day magicians who are seeking the darker side and secrets of Western magic. But that Frankenstein, the novel, becomes the, the catalyst for um, uh, the change in Agrippa's uh, career. At least this is, um, uh, this is how um, uh, she had suggests, uh, uh, suggests, uh, suggests that point. Um, what, what I think Mary Shelley sought to explore is not the opposition, but the relationship between alchemy and science. And um, because Victor did not see occultism and science as opposed to each other, he was more open to the possibility that each possessed what the other lacked. In short, he attempted to wed the visions of alchemy to the methodology of science. And he deliberately returned to a prior moment in the history of science, when science drew upon occult insights and was acceptable to do so. <coughs> so I suggest that Victor's dissatisfaction with science and his resolve to return to ancient studies is linked to an effort to recover a history in which science is built on occult um, technologies. Thank you. Hi, nice to see so many faces. The term monster comes from the Latin word monstrare, to show or reveal. It's related to the English word remonstrance, a term of critique of an edge of moral and pedagogical superiority. Monsters thus made particular demands on interpretation. They were signs of political change or divine judgment, signs of parental, particularly maternal crime or reprobation. Their very physiognomy was a tool of predestinary legibility, a revelation of the nature of the crime. Monsters matched a disciplinary regime in which criminals' bodies, branded or mutilated, bore the signs of their transgression. But they also served a theological disciplinary regime in which human secrets, particularly spiritual or sexual ones, and almost impossible to police by human forensic means, would be brought to light. The monstrous body was thus an invitation to the magistrate to do the Lord's work on the wayward body. But stories of monsters were also texts and thus reproducible both in the printing and in the telling. And the interest of curiosity is also always a political interest. Those who read scaffold confessions, for example, were not always aligned with the executioners. As Foucault notes, beneath the apparent morality of the example not to be followed is a whole memory of struggles and confrontations. When Frankenstein's monster is about to kill Victor's little brother, William, whose self-possessive will and assurance of patriarchal inheritance shines from his very golden locks, William remonstrates with the monster. My papa is a syndic, he says, betraying a precocious knowledge of Genevan government. <laughs> <laughs> he is M. Frankenstein, and he will punish you. The monster's escape the magistrate never does punish him, and William dies, has often been read as an extreme or projected version of Victor's escape 
from the narrow circuits of compulsory heterosexuality and domestic tranquility. Victor escapes both his mother and his sister wife. He has that amazing dream where he has a vision of kissing Elizabeth and then she morphs into his dead mother and he sees worms in the folds of her flannel. And into, he disappears into a nature much more materially heterogeneous than the one that he imagines with Elizabeth. And the worms that Victor sees in the folds of his dead mother's flannel have always seemed to me a vision of vitalist, materialist reproduction, what he calls early on the minutiae of causation, a kind of radical and non-heterosexual reproductivity, rather than the gynophobia that they are often understandably taken to be. Frankenstein certainly highlights the violent misogyny of the scene in which Victor destroys the female monster he had started to create. When he goes back to collect his malevolent sounding chemical instruments, he sees the remains of the half finished creature scattered on the floor and almost feels as if he had mangled the living flesh of a human being. But the novel also highlights the violence of the idealizing male gaze in a scene that functions as a kind of aesthetic inversion when Victor sees the dead body of Elizabeth, lifeless and inanimate, thrown across the bed, her head hanging down, and her pale and distorted features half covered by her hair. Each death, of course, just feeds his desire to be revenged upon and to be locked in a death spiral with the monster he has created out of nature's dark materials, to follow the monster's trace and his black stamp across the northern reaches of the land known to man. In the introduction to the 1831 edition, Mary Shelley wrote that the place in which she wrote was an eyrie of freedom, where unheeded I could commune with the creatures of my fancy. Uninterested in being the heroine of her own tales, she writes that she was not confined to my own identity. I could people the hours with creations far more interesting. Invention, she admits, with what she calls humility, does not consist in creating out of a void but out of chaos. The materials must, in the first place, be afforded. It can give form to dark, shapeless substances that cannot bring into being the substance itself. The difficulty, as Victor notes, is less in possessing the capacity to bestow animation than to, quote, prepare a frame for the reception of it with its intricacies of fibers, muscles, and veins. Here we see Mary Shelley in dialogue with a different aspect of Milton, not the atom of did I request thee maker from clay to mold me man, and nor the Satan who brings his hell within him wherever he goes, but rather the spirits described in the first book of Paradise Lost, who when they please, and this is a bit of a quotation but it's worth it, I, I thought Dustin was going to say it, who, when they please, can either sex assume, or both, so soft and uncompounded is their essence pure, nor tied or manacled with joint or limb, nor founded on the brittle strength of bones like cumbrous flesh, that in what shape they choose, dilated or condensed, bright or obscure, can execute their airy purposes, and works of love or enmity fulfill. When Victor retreats to Chamonix in the Alps to mourn the deaths of William and Justine amidst the elements in their most terrific guise, he has a moment of sublimity in which he calls on the, quote, wandering spirits, if indeed ye wander, and do not rest in your narrow beds. <coughs> Allow me this faint happiness, or take me as your companion away from the joys of life. As he says this, the monster, whose stature seemed to exceed that of a man, comes upon him with a superhuman speed, bounding across the crevices in the ice, among which Richter, in his poor human frame, had walked with caution. He asks Victor if he can be his creature, but Victor denies him. There can be no community between you and me. The monster nonetheless insists that Victor hear his story. <coughs> 
And his story begins with a radiant form rising from among the trees to lessen his desolation. And it culminates in many ways with his embrace of human learning in which he learns this chief insight, quote, that the possessions most esteemed by your fellow creatures were high and unsullied descent united with riches. And that was the height of humane learning. In 1993, 25 years ago, the transgender scholar Susan Stryker wrote a performance piece, come article, in which she returned <coughs> to the scene of this encounter between Victor and his monster. <coughs> My words to Victor Frankenstein above the village of Chamonix performing transgender rage. In light of last night's news that the White House is seeking to take away transgender rights and reduce gender to two biological sexes, I thought I'd end my comments today. I did not know this was going to happen. <laughs> um, with her words. She takes on the terms creature and monster as monikers of resistance to the violence of gendered binaries. And this is what she says. The affront you humans take at being called a creature results from the threat the term poses to your status as lords of creation. Being elevated above mere material existence As in the case of being called it, being called a creature suggests the lack or loss of a superior personhood. I find no shame, however, in acknowledging my egalitarian relationship with non-human material beings. Everything emerges from the same matrix of possibilities. Monsters, like angels, functioned as messengers and heralds of the extraordinary. They serve to announce impending revelation, saying in effect, pay attention. It's something of profound importance is happening. Thank you. Um, as it turns out, I'm going to be offering another angle on romanticism, I think. Um, I, I want to touch on the importance of Frankenstein in recent reflection on masculine identity and more broadly the organization of gender and sexuality as structures of social life. In 1985, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick published a hugely influential book entitled Between Men, which has often been referred to as the founding text of uh, gay studies. In this work, uh, she refers to Shelley's novel as a central example of what she calls the paranoid gothic. These are novels in which male characters feel themselves persecuted by, and often under the compulsion of, another man. Following Freud, Sedgwick interprets this paranoia as an expression of homosexual panic. What does this mean, and how might it matter? Briefly, Sedgwick is interested in the affective glue, as it were, that shapes social relations between men. She calls this force male homosocial desire. Homosocial is crucially not a synonym for homosexual, though you might infer that from a great deal of scholarship that confuses the terms. Instead, male homosocial desire, as Sedgwick understands it, shapes a broad spectrum, that's her word, of relations between and among men. She's interested in precisely the fluidity of positions on this spectrum. The fact that, as she puts it, for a man to be a man's man is separated only by an invisible carefully blurred, always already crossed line from being interested in men. A man patting another man on the rear signifies one thing on a football field, something very different, we presume, in a Chelsea bar. That we could feel secure in this distinction, or surprised by the psychic proximity of the two gestures, is a measure of the powerful social forces that regulate the spectrum of male homosocial desire. The most powerful mechanism of this regulation, Sedgwick argues, is homophobia. The homosexual panic that she discerns in Frankenstein is thus a, a measure of the effectiveness of the violent interdiction of certain forms of homosocial desire in enforcing a normative masculinity. 
that regulatory force is most obvious in the vulnerability of homosexual men to various forms of overt discrimination and persecution and violence. But the power of homophobia works more subtly and pervasively throughout the literature Sedgwick analyzes as an ongoing male anxiety to be constantly proving oneself a proper man, to hunger for recognition from other men while yet resisting the possibility that one is interested in men. This might not seem a very productive angle on Frankenstein. How, how does one take it beyond a fairly banal observation that psychic doubles such as Frankenstein and his creation clearly are, are inevitably erotically uh, charged since they both uh, identify and in a sense desire one another. But what Sedgwick does, although she refers to Frankenstein only in passing, is suggest how we might think about these sexual attractions in, in a broader social and political structuring of desire. The paranoid Gothic, she argues, is specifically not about homosexuals or the homosexual. Instead, heterosexuality is by definition its subject. Heterosexuality, however, understood as a particular organization of male homosexual desire, not a biological drive, which is also reflected in and sustained by social norms and practices. That organization is most notably at work in institutions of courtship, marriage, and the family, institutions that are often summed up uh, by anthropologists as instances of what they call the traffic in women. Men <coughs> organize relationships very often through women, giving them away in marriage, competing for them, and so on. Frankenstein, of course, depicts the utter derangement of courtship, marriage, and the family. But that wreckage, I think, exposes the burdens of the regimen of heterosexuality, as it has to be forcefully organized. In particular, the novel, I think, captures with remarkable vividness the origins of what Freud will come to call the Oedipus complex. Both Frankenstein and this monster are eventually deprived of all forms of emotional gratification and support, aside from that which inheres in their deadly rivalry. I have no relation or friend upon earth, the monster tells old de Lacy. He is, in effect, asking to be adopted, to be taken into this surrogate family, only to be greeted with horror when the rest of the family returns. Of course, the monster's remark is not quite true. He does have a relation on earth. He has a father, but a father who has disowned him, and who does everything in his power to thwart the monster's desire for the prerogatives of normative manhood. When the monster implores Frankenstein to provide him with a female companion, Frankenstein, unlike the creator of Genesis, denies this solace, since he is appalled by the thought of the monster producing a family. The monster, in turn, finds revenge by depriving Frankenstein of a family of his own through the murder of Elizabeth. As each character tries to assert his mastery over the other, and in the process strips away every form of emotional connection with the wider world, Shelley amplifies the sense that the relationship between these two characters is, for them, not only the most important thing in the world, but the only thing in the world. In a way, the placidity of Frankenstein's relation to his own father, I think, exacerbates the sense of the ferocious rivalry between these two men. That ferocious rivalry, uh, really an extraordinarily volatile compound of revulsion and identification, in effect, I think, displaces the ideal of the bourgeois family, that ideal which, over the course of the 19th century, became itself increasingly understood as an all-enclosed psychic space cordoned off from a wider world. What I'm suggesting then is that as it displaces that idea, the struggle between Frankenstein and his son captures in especially stark form the psychic stresses that would come to fascinate a young physician in Vienna. Freud's notion of the edible complex, we might conclude, owes, more to, uh, to, owes less to ancient Thebes than it does to Mary Shelley's Geneva. Thank you all um, for those six very penetrating and uh, yes, very interesting ways of looking at this. I wish you could all talk to each other now, but I want to open it up as well to